guys. Um, I'm a bit sick, so my voice is might be a little bit strange. And it might be a bit sniffly, and I apologize for that. But I really wanted to still do a video for you guys. Um, because today I wanted to talk to you about the Epic of Gilgamesh. Now this uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh is an epic poem from Mesopotamia. It's one of the oldest surviving works of literature. And it doesn't, it doesn't have an author, we don't know who it is, because it's so old. Um, and I wanted to sort of read to you the beginning and then talk to you a little bit about what I guess what happens in the story, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna try not to spoil anything, even though I know that <laughs> this being the oldest work of literature, I feel like spoilers is going to apply least to this work, if anything, but I do really encourage you guys to read this because it's a fascinating story, and because of that I really don't want to tell you how it ends. But, um, this epic poem, this version of it that I have, has been written out more like a story, even though the original has been written on multiple tablets. So, I will start by reading you the prologue, prologue which sort of talks about Gilgamesh. I will proclaim to the world the deeds of Gilgamesh. This was the man to whom all things were known. This was the king who knew the countries of the world. He was wise. He saw mysteries and knew secret things. He brought us a tale of the days before the flood. He went on a long journey, was weary, worn out with labor, returning. He rested, engraved on a stone the whole story. When the gods created Gilgamesh, they gave him a perfect body. Shamash, the glorious sun, endowed him with beauty. Adad, the, the god of the storm, endowed him with courage. The great gods made his beauty perfect, surpassing all others, terrifying, like a great wild bull. Two-thirds they made him god, and one-third man. In Uruk he built walls, a great rampart, the temple of blessed Eana, for the god of the firmament Anu, and for Ishtar, the goddess of love. Look at it still today. The outer wall where the cornice runs, it shines with the brilliance of copper, and the inner wall it has no equal. Touch the threshold, it is ancient. Approach Eana, the dwelling of Ishtar, our lady of love and war, like of which no latter-day king, no man alive can equal. Climb upon the wall of Uruk, walk along it, I say, regard the foundation terrace and examine the masonry. Is it not burnt? brick and good, the seven sages laid the foundations. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of the character of Gilgamesh. He is, there have been a lot of uh, similarities drawn between this story and a number of other stories, but immediately I see the connection between him and Hercules. Although he is two-thirds god instead of half, but still, um, described as being, you know, created by the gods to be beautiful and perfect and strong and courageous. Um, so, I am going to now read to you the beginning of the first chapter called The Coming of Enkidu, which brings up this secondary character in Kidu and talks about the circumstances and then I'm going to talk a little bit about what happens later in the story after this part. Gilgamesh went abroad in the world but he met with none who could withstand his arms till he came to Uruk. But the men of Uruk muttered in their houses, Gilgamesh sounds the toxin for his amusement, his arrogance has no bounds by day or night. No son is left with his father, for Gilgamesh takes them all, even the children. 
Yet the king should be a shepherd to his people. His lust leaves no virgin to her lover, neither the warrior's daughter nor the wife of the noble. Yet this is the shepherd of the city, wise, comely, and resolute. The gods heard their lament. The gods of heaven cried to the lord of Uruk, to Anu, the god of Uruk. A goddess made him strong and savage as a bull, but none can withstand his arms. No son is left with his father, for Gilgamesh takes them all. And is this the king, the shepherd of his people? His lust leaves no virgin to her lover, neither the warrior's daughter nor the wife of the noble. When Anu heard their lamentation, the gods cried to Aruru, the goddess of creation, You made him, O Aruru, now create his equal. Let it be as like him as his own reflection, his second self, stormy heart for stormy heart. Let them contend together and leave Uruk in quiet. So the goddess conceived an image in her mind, and it was the stuff of Anu of the firmament. She dipped her hands in water and pinched off clay. She let it fall in the wilderness, and noble Enkidu was created. There, there was virtue in him of the god of war, of Minur Minurta himself. His body was rough. He had long hair like a woman's. It waved like the hair of Nisaba, the goddess of corn. His body was covered with matted hair, like Samukans, the god of cattle. He was innocent of mankind. He knew nothing of the cultivated land. Enkidu ate grass in the hills with the gazelle, and lurked with the wild beasts at the waterholes. He had joy of the water with the herds of wild game. But there was a trapper who met him one day face to face at the drinking hole, for the wild game had entered his territory. On three days he met him face to face, and the trapper was frozen with fear. He went back to his house with the game that he had caught, and he was dumb, benumbed with terror. His face was altered, like that of one who has made a long journey. With awe in his heart, he spoke to his father. Father, there is a man unlike any other, who comes down from the hills. He is the strongest in the world. He is like an immortal from heaven. He ranges over the hills with wild beasts and eats grass. He ranges through your land and comes down to the wells. I am afraid and dare not go near him. He fills in the pits which I dig and tears up my traps for the game. He helps the beasts to escape and now they slip through my fingers. So this is the introduction of Enkidu, who is created by the gods to be an equal to Gilgamesh. And as the story goes on, basically what happens is this trapper's father tells him, go find Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh is actually the strongest man and will be able to figure out a way to tame this wild man. So what they do is they bring a prostitute who, at the time, prostitutes were considered to be sort of women of the temple. So it, it's not like prostitution today. It was a much more religious and spiritual thing. Um, I can't think of any other, I guess, connections between that, but it they sort of make me think of companions from Firefly, in the sense that it's not like a dirty thing to be a prostitute, but basically they bring a prostitute and they have her seduce Enkidu, and that sort of makes him into a man. And it's interesting because, you know, Nowadays, we also kind of have this whole idea of um, the idea that, you know, a girl becomes a woman when she's able to have kids, just like, you know, a boy becomes a man. This is very, I guess, linked. And similarly, or, you know, in other some cultures as well, you know, a woman, uh, a girl becomes a woman or a boy becomes a man when they have sex for the first time. So I find it interesting that this is how they tame the wild man. They, he comes 
from a beast into a man. And then he describes after um, this prostitute seduces him. He goes back and the wild beasts are afraid of him now. You know, he's different, he's changed. So he essentially can't go back to that life. He is forced to sort of go and live with the people. So he develops this friendship with Gilgamesh, being given that they are equals. And that's what's really interesting is that they are sort of these two parts with Gilgamesh being the king who has all this stuff and who has all this power and sort of doesn't do very well with it as is, as he's described he will take all the boys to be warriors and kind of have sex with all the women kind of all over the place you know and he gets away with it because he's the king and so uh Enkidu was sort of brought in as this they become like best friends and Enkidu kind of reigns him in a little bit because Enkidu is very innocent he doesn't I guess he isn't as tainted by society, I guess you could say. Um, it's interesting. It's reminiscent to me of, like, Tarzan, for example. Um, the story of Tarzan, or, I mean, I as a kid watched the Disney movie, but still, he's very innocent to, you know, the idea of things like power and taking advantage of a situation like that, very innocent. So for the rest of the story, these two, and I don't know on the cover, okay, because I want to show you the cover. The cover shows Gilgamesh between two demigods supporting the sun. So I guess this is Gilgamesh, and these are two gods. I was hoping that one of them would be in Kidu, but... I guess not, but um, for the rest of the story, it's Gilgamesh and Enkidu uh, going on adventures, defeating monsters, um, and searching for eternal life. And the second half is more the search for eternal life, and I don't want to give too much away about that, but. Basically, it brings up this whole idea of, is there such thing as internal life? How can we be immortal? You know, how can we immortalize ourselves? And, um, the first half is largely about what does it mean to be human? You know? Like, humans, is it, like, to make mistakes, to, uh, admit your mistakes, to face the consequences, to, uh, you know, what does it mean to be good versus to be evil, to human versus the wild man is a huge dichotomy that is very important throughout this book. And you can sort of, I mean, you can, it's, it's made very obvious in the beginning part that I've explained to you with Enkidu versus Gilgamesh, with Gilgamesh being human and being the extreme of human, being that, you know, yes, he is very learned and has a lot of power, but he also takes advantage of that power. And with Enkidu being the wild man and being the extreme example of that, of, yes, he, you know, he eats grass, he hangs out with animals, but he's also very innocent. He would never think of, you know, hurting or taking advantage or anything like so, it's very interesting. Very interesting story. Uh, I highly recommend it. It's, uh, I recognize it's very different from what I have read to you in the past. But with, uh, very, definitely very different from the likes of, uh, Nabokov and modern, modern prose. But I feel like this sort of thing is very important in understanding sort of where literature came from, you know? Like this does sort of, even being one of the oldest 
if not the oldest, I don't know if there's anything older than this, a uh, work of fiction, still sort of has the idea of the hero's journey of, you know, all these things that we learn about in high school English are very much present in this book. So it becomes really interesting to analyze because a lot of the books we end up reading were written after these ideas were come up with. So like, if you read Harry Potter and connect it to the hero's journey, it's like, well, okay, there's a good chance that J.K. Rowling was familiar with the idea of the hero's journey before she wrote that. None of that you don't really know with this. You don't really know what, I guess, archetypes existed back then, or which archetypes and tropes and themes were common back then versus now. So it becomes a very different experience. Anyway, that is the Epic of Gilgamesh. Uh, and I think I'll, I think I'll leave it at that for today, but I will see you guys next time. Bye.